Good evening, everybody. My name is Emily Simon, and I am delighted to welcome all of us here tonight for a presentation by the Black Alliance for Social Empowerment and very good friends and allies uh, regarding their work in the community, particularly focused on the police liaison project that we are all working on. Um, and in context for that, they will be giving a historical uh, intention of policing, the issue of policing and how that has played out in the Rogue Valley, uh, as well as some uh, words regarding uh, the Black and Jewish Alliance uh, and the ways in which we can work together. Um, and the, we anticipate that the presentation will be very personal, very passionate, and very intelligent. Before I introduce our third speaker, who's Dr. Flora White Cooper, Vance will fill us in on how, when, and why BASE came into being and some of their many accomplishments to date. BASE is, um, you know, BASE obviously, as you said, stands for Black Alliance and Social Empowerment. And I want you to all to remember this uh, tagline, thriving community is when it feels good to be home, because that's something that we um, really live by and that we really want to see that everybody feels at home because that's where you feel comfortable and included. BASE is all about building inclusive community. Uh, we're a platform for connection, support, resources, and overall the advancement of Black residents that live here. Um, we have a team of, of nine individuals who are all volunteers and we all have our lanes. And we all support this overall building of a community. Um, we knew that this was something that was necessary based on the historical support and right of uh, black individuals and residents that are here now historically just not being invited to the state at all. So um, there's never been an opportunity to even build a, a, a have a community here. So. We knew base just from that front. But essential and why we're here today is safety. It's a key objective because everything that I've just listed uh, right now cannot be possible and cannot be sustainable unless there is safety. And we know there's a long history and a long resume of um, unjust uh, murders and killings, different things that have happened um, to black residents uh, black people across this nation. And so safety becomes a big deal. And we're hoping that throughout today, um, we can be able to share with you guys about our liaison program, explain how important it is. So um, with that, thank you so much for having me. And I hope I didn't take too much time, but there's a lot more <laughs> to share. So let's start uh, here. Uh, I want to start off in the 1600s. As early as the 1600s been recorded, um, and some arguably say the 1700s, uh, policing started in South Carolina. And uh, the first form of policing they called were slave patrols. So they used that term slave patrols uh, initially in this early period in America. And what that um, entailed was, it was under the Fugitive Slave Acts. Uh, the patrols, they were responsible for arresting runaway slaves and returning them uh, to the plantations. And as you see here in the photos, you can see a lot of these people looked like freedmen. Uh, here, especially in, in, in two of these photos so they look like freedmen and like I mentioned before you know uh, some of them were freedmen some of them were here before um, on these lands indigenous black Americans and they were free and until um, until the lands were colonized one mission one mission of the of those who were in charge of slave patrolling was to establish tariff so uh, the initial forms of slave patrol was to establish terror. Um, so for, for the, the slaves to be frightened, right? And if they were frightened, then they would not want to run away. They would not want to uprise against the injustices. Um, they were to pursue and apprehend and, re and return the runaway slaves to the plantation owners. So the tactics in order to do this uh, was to use excessive force to control and to uh, to produce a certain type of um, 
behavior in the slave, where the slave wouldn't want to run away. So this is the first form of policing that we see here in America. So it says, I, patroller's name, do swear that I will as searcher for guns, swords, and other weapons among the slaves in my district, faithfully and as privately as I can, discharge the trust reposed in me as the law directs to the best of my power, so help me God. So right there we see already oaths being used. So they didn't just appear, you know, uh, when in modern times, um, my, my oaths are uh, reading someone in Miranda rights. Uh, they started way back then, uh, as early as then. So slave patrols continued until the end of the Civil War and the passage of the 13th Amendment. So following the Civil War during the uh, Reconstruction period, slave patrols were replaced by uh, militia style groups. And uh, they were empowered to control and deny access to equal rights to the free slaves. So they relentlessly and systematically enforced black codes. So slave patrols turned into black codes. And they were strict local and state laws that regulated and restricted access to labor and wages voting rights and general freedoms for formerly enslaved people. So, and then this brings us to the 1830s. Now in the 1830s, Boston uh, formed the first formal police department uh, that was in Boston. And it established the America's uh, law enforcement. So the city founded the police force so it was, and it started out roughly about six men under the supervision of a city marshal. And so they call it the, Bo the Boston Watch. And then it grew to about 120 men. So now we come into the late um, 1800s, around 1868, where they ratified the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which granted protections to, the, to African Americans essentially abolishing the black codes. So now the black codes are being abolished and we're looking at uh, Jim Crow laws, which is most of us already know about those. Those were state and local statutes that legalized uh, racial segregation and swiftly took their place. So it took over the black codes place. And this was another way of regulating people. So by the 1900s, still segregation by the 1900s, Local municipalities began to establish police departments. So now it's growing more now, police departments, to enforce local laws, um, now more nationwide. Uh, and this is including the Jim Crow, which has continued all the way up into the night, or really the 1960s. Um, and some say beyond even that time. And it, it helped to enforce police, police regulation, um, by using excessive brutality on, on African Americans who violated, who, whoever violated the Jim Crow laws. What's interesting, I wanted to share this. Uh, so what's interesting is that a lot of people don't think about women being a part of our early uh, police forces, but they were, especially during World War I. Uh, so we see that women were part of these police uh, forces and they helped to, to regulate Jim Crow laws and they helped to, uh, to, to keep that uh, going. And so they were, uh, especially uh, we see one of the first, um, one of the first documented female police officers was uh, Margaret Foley. Uh, we see a lot of failures to this day in policing uh, that goes on nationally, and uh, and unfortunately, you know, there is there is crisis going on in policing. Um, so we see failures in education, in educating the police forces, and educating the community as well. We see failure in social services, um, so services, so providing safety. Uh, to 
the citizens that they are taking oath to protect. We see failures in public health. So because of numerous deaths, um, you know, the public health of the residents is at risk. And so therefore, there's a lot of distrust in the policing, local policing and state policing. We see gun re uh, crisis and gun, gun regulation laws. So the use of force, uh, not just with the police officers, but also for citizens. We see crisis in criminal justice. So especially in courts, you know, we see ununiform, um, <clears throat> ununiform uh, rulings on the state and uh, governmental level. Uh, we see also crisis in economic development. So this crisis all around with improper policing that we see in this nation. Uh, Dr. Flora and I will actually be discussing current issues with racial justice in Jackson County. Um, and, you know, I'll start off with uh, kind of giving you, we, we've shared with you a lot of the historicals uh, nationwide as well as locally, but I'm here to talk to you a little bit about present day, um, things that have happened uh, recently. Um, you know, a lot of people um, tend to say, you know, there's not a lot of black people here. So, um, you know, those things don't happen, but I'm here to let you know they do happen and they are happening. Um, and as Justin reported and stated, a lot of this stuff doesn't get reported. A lot of this stuff doesn't get uh, stated because there is a sense of, um, you know, fear and or non-trust, right? Um, to go to people that are supposed to be the safety people for you. But at the same time, those safety people are the ones that are causing trauma or harm to you. Um, 2021 in Ashland, so this is just last year, a national local black man was racially attacked at a gas station. Um, this this event was very severe and he was uh, instrumental in right in the phase of our liaison program. Um, so just a, a, you know, a couple years ago, a few years ago, I'll say, uh, my daughter was a part of OSF's um, play production, Hairspray. Um, and if any of you know that, that's a, it deals with you know segregation, all kinds of stuff, right? Um, and so it required me to drive her late at night, um, you know, back and forth to Ashland, coming back because I live in Medford, so I was going back and forth quite a bit. And um, you know, one of the things that I was always taught, I, I have no record, I have a police record, I have I've never been to jail, I, none of that exists on my record. Um, but one of the things I was always naturally taught from, from my parents and my experience growing up was that, you know, you, your encounter with police, right, um, could be dangerous. Um, you know, even if you aren't doing anything wrong. Um, there's a certain type of fear and certain type of, I, I would say, I would call it a generational trauma that takes place um, when you're come in contact with the police. Normally, it's not a good situation. And so um, taking my story on to what, 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 what happened with uh, my daughter, um, over the course of, I would say, a month, I was pulled over, um, I counted it, it was six times in one month. It felt like a hundred times, right? Because that excessive being stopped and, and harassed uh, just felt uh, very excessive. Um, and so I, I just want to walk through with you what, what took place. So I would drop my daughter, off, um, you know, earlier in the, in, the, in the evening. And then, you know, the show was four hours. So I'd come back home to Medford and then I would have to, you know, shoot back over to pick her up. You know, the first time I got stopped, you know, I, I come, I'm coming off the exit. I'm at the stop sign and I see a police officer directly to my right. We make eye contact with each other. And then, you know, I proceed on my right and, and go. Next thing you know, uh, you know, the lights are behind me. And, and you know, I want to kind of have you guys understand the, the fear that kind of takes place when you see those lights. Um, you know, I've, I've kind of trained myself over the years watching a lot of different events that have taken place okay just keep your hands up here uh don't say anything you know crazy i don't know what's going on i don't know why i'm being pulled over. 
I get pulled over. He comes over to the car and he says to me, um, do you know why you're being pulled over? I say, no, I do not, sir. Uh, he tells me that I did not stop long enough at the stop sign. I said, okay. I, uh, so he takes my, my, my information. He runs back to his car and I'm, I'm waiting and I'm waiting. I'm waiting. He literally makes me late to get my daughter. Um, so I'm a little, little frustrated. So that's one event. I go on with my day. I pick up my daughter. She can clearly sense I'm a little frustrated. You're supposed to be happy picking her up after a big show. But, you know, I played it, played it to how I need to play it. The next couple times, I, I do the same thing. Drop my daughter off. I'm coming back into Ashland. I make it past the stop sign getting off the exit now. And I'm going uh, downtown. And um, sure enough, another cop pulls me over. I'm literally almost 200 or so meters away from OSF. So now I'm just pulled over right before getting my daughter. Um, at this moment, uh, he comes and comes over to my car. I don't know what's going on again. Got my hands up. I'm just being cool, calm, and collective. He uh, tells me, I you know why I'm pulling you over. I do not know why you're pulling me over. He tells me that I was swerving uh, downtown. I'm sure you guys have driven downtown. You only go about 15 miles per hour or so uh, in that area. So I, I, he takes my information, runs, you know, and I don't know what they're running. But they're, you know, he's running whatever. He literally is making me late getting my daughter again. And so, and that this one happened twice, by the way, that same kind of thing. So now I'm really frustrated. I get her. Um, and, you know, I think he almost kind of sensed a little antsiness, but, you know, I really held back, get my daughter. This time, my daughter's experience is, is much worse because she can, she really knows I'm upset. So now what's happening based on the frustration that I'm having, that's happening with me is now I'm panning over to my daughter and she's now experiencing my trauma. Um, and this is why I mentioned to you guys in the beginning, it's a generational trauma that continues to perpetuate itself. And the ideology of what happens now is being passed on. And so we get home and this time I take a couple of days off. I have my wife uh, drive her because I just, I don't understand what's going on and I'm, I know I'm going to lose it. And I can tell I'm a very calm person. I don't, I don't lose it on a lot of stuff. But, you know, the, the frustration was getting so high and I could see in many cases why someone can lose it if this is something that many people are experiencing. Um, the next moment, uh, after a couple of few days off, I come back to taking my daughter uh, or taking my daughter to OSF. But this time I bring a friend with me um, because I, I told him I want him to see what happens. Um, and my friend is in the back seat because my daughter's in the front because we have to drop her off. Now, this is a day show, so this time it's not at night. We're driving in. Um, I drop my daughter off, okay? As soon as we're leaving, we're pulled over. I look back to my friend and I say, see, I told you, this always happens. He's not like me. He's a, he's a little bit more fire, okay? Um, cop comes over to our window and asks do you know why you're being pulled over no we don't know why you're we don't know why you're pulling us over and the first thing he says to us is why is he in the back seat and my friend fires off and says you know he's a, a little bit different than me but he fires off and says because i can be in the back seat you know and so he takes my information goes back and does whatever he must do <clears throat> and then he comes back again we get our stuff and we get to leave okay so this this is kind of just a segue of, of issues that keep happening and the last time uh, in this month uh, just to cut this story a little bit short so i can get to some of the meat of this um the last time this happens um i i it was a nighttime event i come back into ash and um drop my daughter off right and this time i say to myself I am not going to leave Ash. I'm going to just stay here. Clearly, my my day, my lifestyle, everything is interrupted just by me driving. Okay, um, so I have a, a half brother that was attending SOU at the time, and so I said, I'm just go to his house. He lives like just a few blocks from from, uh, from OSF. 
go to his house and as soon as it's time for me to pick up my dollar i think there's no way i'm gonna i'm gonna make this uh as soon as i go and pick up my daughter um i'm pulled over and this time it's a saturday um the, the cop comes over to me and i'm mad okay i'm not gonna lie i am mad um i just just i don't say anything um and the first thing he says to me is have you been drinking no i haven't been drinking i don't even drink uh he tells me he wants my license registration and this time i'm fumbling around trying to find the stuff um you know i'm really irritated so i'm just not even in the mood um and it takes me so long to find my stuff i couldn't find my registration form for whatever reason but he actually tells me um he gets a call on his uh little badge thing because i'm assuming it's saturday night so people are all out um he gets a call and he and he tells me uh you're taking too long for me and um next time don't waste my time and then he leaves so I go and pick up my daughter and um, meanwhile, I want you guys to understand over the course of all of these events that are taking place, um, I'm furious, okay? And my daughter's getting that that passed on to her and she's feeling that and I know she's knowing that I'm being, I'm being traumatized, I'm being hurt, things are happening to me, okay? She may not be able to explain it all, but she knows these things are happening. And for me, I'm supposed to be seeing my daughter and being happy and being, um, you know, celebrate her. She just got done with a great show. And um, I could never do that in that whole month. I could never do that because of how many times this event kept happening. And every time I tell this story, I get a little choked up because it just re uh, brings back that trauma. That, um, oh man, <laughs> brings back that uh the, the pain of that that just going through that and um oh wow oh, i was gonna make it this time um so um wow i say this to you guys because um the perpetuated ideology that i got when i was a kid knowing about you know the experience to black folks is being now passed on to my daughter and she has an ideology. And the reason for this liaison program is to get proactive, to do something, to change things, to make it a little better. Okay, so the police liaison program. So um, really what it is, is um, the Southern Oregon Racial Equity Liaison's primary goal is to serve as a protective intermediary for black residents or action with law enforcement. As I just expressed to you, my story about uh, the very people that are supposed to be keeping us safe are the very people I was supposed to go to um, for the, the, the harassment or, or trauma that I was experiencing. So uh, that just doesn't work. We also took a look at you know, what we needed in terms of um, um, those kinds of situations. And so the goal is to be um, vocally equitable, uh, I'm sorry, the program's goal is to cultivate a vocally equitable law enforcement, a law enforcement policies in our valley and improve the relationship between law enforcement and black residents by creating accountable and transparent relationships. Obviously, George Floyd was one of the biggest events that that, that took shape and took place um, that everybody recognized. Unfortunately, it wasn't the, the first time, but it was the one that everyone um, had their eyes on, which gave us um, you know, a lot of momentum in the time being um, to really streamline and go forward with trying to be proactive in some way in terms of safety because it was on an all-time high and awareness was around for everybody in the community. Ashland had a, a protest that they were putting together and I'm actually not one to really want to protest because um, I, I personally just feel we've done that a lot and I, I would rather have a conversation, but this protest was different. Um, what they did is they set up a room where we could come together and just talk to each other and, and, and engage with each other prior to going out to the protest. And I, I, I thought there was something kind of special about that. So me and my family actually, uh, and Dr. Ford's family, we all went to this, um, to this protest in Ashland and, and, and kind of grouped up together. Now, mind you, 
this event is after my daughter had experienced everything that I've been through, right? And something remarkable happened at this particular protest that um, set everything in motion for me. And I want to show it to you right here. This is actually my daughter. Out of nowhere, she decided that she wanted to stand up for what's right. And she just said she wanted to speak. No one had any idea she was going to do this. So here's what she said. I think she she actually broke down a little bit there, but that was a very important moment for me uh, personally um, to ensure that I got proactive because I knew um, what she meant by that. I knew what she meant by children and the next generation being aware of these problems so that they can help to change them. And so following that event, um, I had my eyes set on trying to figure out what we can do um, in terms of safety. And I had, uh, going into this next phase here, I had uh, been awa uh, made aware of an event that was happening with our local law enforcement leaders by this ORD2 Indivisible group. It's a democratic group that was having and hosting a forum with the local law enforcement leaders around policing during Black Lives, or policing during Black Lives Matter is what it was called. And I thought that was kind of interesting knowing that they were having such a forum. And I was kind of curious why Black community members were not aware of it. So this was literally a day before the event that I heard of it. So I scrambled around to try to figure out how we could get uh, more people in the community knowing about this meeting. And I sent the invite to a bunch of community members. And at this meeting, um, it, it pressed buttons um, that were pretty um, hurtful for a lot of people. Uh, like our local law enforcement were basically saying that there's no racism, there's no problems here. Um, and I know what I just experienced. I know what my daughter's saying. I know what the, the, the whole community is feeling. And so it really, pushed a lot of buttons and pushed us forward to really making sure, like I said, having those conversations. And so we reached out. I had a couple of cool lawyers that are both on the um, call with us today um, that started to help prep and help uh, kind of be there and support for us. And um, one of the first things we did is we reached out to all the local law enforcement leaders that were a part of that call and said, let's have an actual conversation with residents of the Valley that are black. Um, I knew I could bring those kind of folks together. Um, and I think they need to hear from us and not just be saying things um, from their own um, viewpoint. And so thus was this next phase here that you see of the um, yellow, our voices. And this is one of the first forums held where we brought all of the, uh, we brought black residents to the Zoom table. We had, I, I, I don't know, there was probably over 50 or so black residents there. And um, they all came to this forum and we had the, the local law enforcement leaders there and they got to hear from us. They got to hear our stories. They got to hear our experiences. And this is where um, it segued into um, putting forth a commitment towards what we wanted to do and where we wanted to go. We reached out to black residents and we knew that there was um, a lack of trust. We knew that there was a lack of wanting to connect or share or contact police even in the case of a hate crime so we knew we had to um, formulate something that was like this liaison program so that's when you get kind of into this next um, 
form, this green one here um, that says commitment. We kind of put together a, a polished look at what a liaison program could look like. And then we held another form and we got our commitments and we laid it out for the uh, for our uh, local law enforcement leaders and they committed. And this last um, document here is their signatures to the form that we created to continue the program and move it forward. Um, so, um, so I'll just skip this. So what we, what we got going on right now, just so you're aware is that base and our, our supportive team here of lawyers, um, we meet with the local law enforcement leaders every single month. We meet as a team weekly to keep advancing and um, going through the next phases of trying to develop this program. Um, we have a community petition out there that's on our website where you can learn about the entire program as well as sign on to being a supportive of the of the program. And we have over 100 signatures already on there. We have letters of support from a variety of different organizations. And uh, the current process we're in right now is, you know, uh, Dr. Flora herself is really um, having those personal conversations to keep uh, those phases of the development of the program going and we're currently working on grant funding to support um, what we envision for the entire program. As uh, um, Emily said to you earlier, we do have our chief interim liaison dr flora and just to give you a, a quick highlight um you know she's here to really help to make sure you know that the training is being done properly and or what t training that, that the officers and the departments are getting um she becomes a trusted contact for black residents uh, we know that we need somebody to contact if you look at my experience alone who what is i going to contact this this is a great person for me to contact um and then she uh, our liaison, right, provides oversight so the community has oversight so the community knows what's going on and, and, and we can change things as necessary. Um, we also are preparing to have an oversight committee so those in the community are more actively engaged and have an umbrella awareness of what's going on. It brings more community representation as well as uh, understanding of the objectives of the liaison. Um, on our webpage, you can go on and check out the program info data statistics submission you can submit to the liaison so she has gotten a few um calls already that we've uh, attended to um so that's just the highlight of that we have aligned the liaison so far with a variety of different organizations because you never know what kind of call might come in right and so we need those supportive groups and that goes back to that overall base objective of collaborations right we need the proper resources to help assist us in the areas where we need support. And again, um, this partnership has been solidified. I mean, we talk with these guys, we got things signed off and we're ready to move forward. And what this overall impact could look like for us is a safer environment. Um, it's a national model, first of its kind. It creates potentially more job opportunities. Um, more people are gonna wanna move here versus leave here. Um, it opens up more community collaborations and overall it creates an anti-racist culture within Southern Oregon, which benefits mm -hmm. every single person here. And at that, I'll pass it over um, to, to Dr. Flora. They are, you know, they have signed commitments, as you saw in the, in the presentation, the wonderful presentation that Vance brought to us. They signed a commitment to, to work with the liaison, the base liaison program, uh, to work with us and ensuring that um, the black residents can feel safer, safer where they live, to provide safer streets, uh, to be, to be, um, how can I say it, very neutral, very neutral in their approach to providing safety overall, you know, and safety in it, you know, for all citizens, but safety overall for our community. So we share these communities, you know, we don't, we're not segregated anymore. You know, those days are over, you know, I really hope so. <laughs> uh, that's what we're striving for. You know, we share these lands. These lands are not owned to anyone. You know, we share these lands. You know, these are all our lands to share. And those oaths that we talked about before, you know, they are committed to upholding safety, 
you know, I have to say that again, safety for all residents on these lands. You know, that's what they're committed to doing. They're committed to working with the liaison team to, to um, get extra training that they have not been getting when it comes to cultural sensitivity. They have committed also, not just Jackson County, but, but uh, statewide, you know, um, they have really committed to, to improving and the objectives uh, that we all agreed upon that would be most beneficial uh, to the black residents here. Uh, they have committed to structuring their police departments and sheriff departments in a way uh, where we would they would lessen biases and prejudices that they come into their uh, police and sheriff departments with. We're talking about human beings. We're not talking about robots. You know, they come with their own prejudices and biases. And those are the things that they have, the chiefs and the sheriff committed to, to rectifying if they can. You know, some of these biases, it takes a while, right? It took years to develop. It takes a while, you know, but they have at least committed to recognizing those biases and, pre and prejudices within their departments. To say that even though these may still exist, we will not take it out on other people. Mm. That is so important to recognize first and then commit that you're not going to take it out on other people based on the color of their skin. That's so important. So that's the main big commitment that these chiefs, police chiefs and sheriffs committed to. That's the main one. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Flora, and thank you, Vance, and thank you, Justin, and thank you, everybody.